The year is 343 BCE, and Rome was about to march to war. In the previous year, the Roman Senate had received a plea for assistance from the Campanians. The Campanians were at war with the Samnites, and were on the brink of complete and utter defeat. Rome had seemingly gone against their agreed upon treaty with the Samnites in favor of protecting the Campanians. Rome had tried to simply scare the Samnites away, with vague threats and appeals to the very same treaty that the Romans had decided to reject. The Samnites, though, were not going to back down so easily, and Rome had two options. They could either back down and allow the Samnites to conquer Capua, and by extension the Campanians, or they could march off to war. I'm sure I don't need to tell you which option the Romans chose. So, could they win this war? If they did win the war, what would they gain? If they lost, what would they lose? And was any of this even real? Let's talk about it. Livy tells us that both consuls for the year, Marcus Valerius Corvus and Aulius Cornelius Cossus, marched off to wage war against the Samnites. This tells us that the Samnites were considered the primary threat, and maybe even the only threat, to the Roman state. For both consuls to be sent off to the same war signaled a degree of self-assuredness for the Romans. Remember that at this point in Roman history, it was the consuls who held the power of imperium in military matters. Technically, only the consuls could command Rome's military in anything but the most basic of maneuvers. So to send both of these two men off to the same place was a sign that Rome was both serious about this war and confident in the safety of their own territory. Each consul was given his own army to command. Marcus Corvus led his army into Campania, while Aulius Cossus led his army into Samnium. Marcus Corvus marched his army to somewhere around Mount Garrus, a volcanic mountain located near the city of Cumae, while Aulius Cossus led his army to the Samnite city of Satacula. We are not given an exact timeline, so we aren't sure how long it took, but it seems like fighting broke out fairly quickly. The first consul to engage the enemy was Marcus Corvus. We are told that right after instructing his army to encamp at the base of Mount Garius, the Samnites quickly showed up. The Samnites were already present in Campania. Remember, they had been close to taking the city of Capua, a city only a day's march away from Cumae. And secondly, they assumed that the main theater of the war would be in Campania. This really made a lot of sense if you consider the supposed reason for this war, Rome's defense of Campania. Naturally then, the Samnites would assume that most, if not all, of the fighting would take place in Campania. They would be proven wrong, but back to that in a moment. We are told that both sides briefly prodded each other with a few skirmishes, before eventually Marcus Corvus decided that Rome should strike first. Corvus ordered his men out of camp, and a battle quickly ensued. At first, the battle seemed completely even, with neither side being able to gain any sort of advantage. Seeing this, Marcus Corvus knew he needed to do something to change the tide of battle, or risk a stalemate, or even worse, a long protracted battle that would end with the Romans out of camp and the Samnites free to sally out. Marcus ordered his cavalry to directly charge at the Samnite line, hoping to poke a hole in the line through which his infantry could then charge through. This failed miserably, and the Roman cavalry was forced to retreat or face being pulled from their horses. Marcus, though, was unwilling to give in so easily. He dismounted, and personally led an infantry charge against the Samnite line. This too was pushed back. The battle at this point had gone on for most of the day, and darkness was quickly approaching. This meant that one way or another, that battle was about to end. Nighttime fighting is almost never a good idea, and the Romans knew this. Livy tells us that the Romans, despite their tiredness and their disappointment over the failed attempts to break the Samnite line, came together for one last desperate attempt to break the line. This attack apparently worked, and the center portion of the Samnite line crumbled. The Romans poured through and would have slaughtered the Samnites if not for nightfall. The Romans reluctantly withdrew and allowed the battered Samnites a chance to regroup. However, come morning, the Romans would find that the Samnites had retreated rather than face them once again, and Rome had won the day. Livy tells us that sometime after the war, the Samnites were asked why they retreated, and responded with, quote, the eyes of the Romans, which seemed to them to blaze, along with their furious expression and frenzied glare. It was said that after their glorious victory, the Campanians treated the Romans like conquering heroes and showered them in gifts and praise. I'm sure I don't need to tell you what exactly I think of this account. I mean, come on, a battle goes from a stalemate to a sudden rout, not because of any genius military maneuver, but because the Roman soldiers looked intimidating? 
Had they not looked intimidating for the whole fight? Did they bait the Samnites with caring looks before suddenly unleashing their rage in the last few moments of the battle? Something is smelling a bit fishy here, but let's take a look at the rest of the war before we get too deep into this. Now, shortly after, or perhaps even at around the same time, the other consul, Aulius Cossus, led his army deeper into Samnium. Samnium was a very mountainous area, and most of the time the Roman army was forced to navigate through the few passes they knew of. This of course was great for the Samnites, who had intimate knowledge of their mountainous homeland. I mean, a large Roman army marching through a mountain pass where they knew next to nothing about the local terrain, surrounding passes, or little shortcuts through the mountainous terrain, was probably the greatest dream of whatever Samnite commander was assigned to battle the Roman army in question. This was exactly what happened shortly after the Roman army left their encampment at Satacula. The Samnites had trailed the Roman army in their march, and had occupied the highlands above a narrow valley that the Romans would be forced to march through. This was perfect ambush territory. The Romans were apparently ignorant of the threat, and marched right into that narrow valley. Sometime during the ensuing fighting, a military tribune by the name of Publius Decius Mus noticed that one hill had been neglected by the Samnites and had been left completely unoccupied. Publius instantly informed the consul of the hill in question, and was given approval to lead a detachment of Roman troops to claim the hill. Publius led these men up the hill and quickly captured the summit. The Samnites, who had failed to notice Publius until it was too late, panicked and turned their attention away from the main Roman force and towards Publius's men. This allowed Aulius Cossus, the consul, and the majority of the Romans to withdraw to more favorable terrain and get out of the Samnite ambush. This of course left Publius and his men to their own devices. The Samnites quickly surrounded the hill and cut off any chance Publius had of escaping. But they didn't attack. Night had come before they had managed to assault the hill, and so the Samnite army settled down for the night content to wait until the morning to retake the hill and turn their attention back to the main Roman force. Publius, though, was not content to wait the night out. We are told that Publius, along with a few of his centurions, scouted the Samnite positions where they noticed that only a light guard had been put in place. Publius quickly returned to the summit of the hill and informed the men that they would be attempting to break out during the cover of night, silently if they could, but by force if they must. Apparently, the Romans were able to sneak about half of their force through the Samnite defenses before they were discovered. Publius and his men quickly let out a fearsome battle shot, and in the ensuing chaos, managed to get away from the hill and the Samnite camp. The next morning, Publius urged Aulius and the other Romans to quickly assault the Samnite positions, believing that the Samnite camp was disorganized and that the Samnites would be easily routed. Aulius apparently agreed and quickly ordered the army to prepare for battle. The ensuing battle was a complete Roman victory. The Samnites were taken completely unaware and quickly routed. Livy tells us that the 30,000 or so Samnites were slaughtered to a man. Following the battle, Publius and his men were honored by Aulius. Publius himself received a golden chaplet, 100 oxen, and a single white ox with gilded horns, while his men all received double rations, one ox, and two tunics. Publius sacrificed the white ox in the name of Mars and split the other 100 oxen up between his men. Publius was further granted two grass crowns, the highest honor for any individual military commander short of a triumph, for both his saving of the main Roman army during the ambush and his leadership during the Roman escape. Publius would actually go on to be a fairly important figure in Roman lore, and these events served as the foundation for his legend. Once again, I will hold off on giving my full comments on this battle until a little later in the video, but let's just say that I struggle to believe that not only did a large Roman force manage to sneak away from being fully surrounded, but that the same force then participated in an attack only a few hours later and killed 30,000 Samnites. Anyway, more on that in a bit. The next, and final battle, would occur at Susilla, the Samnites. Reeling from two defeats, decided to combine all of their forces into one at the city of Sisula in Campania. Marcus Corvus quickly received word of this gathering and forced marched his men to the city. This meant that the Romans were traveling very lightly. Their baggage train had been left behind. This allowed the Romans to set up a much smaller camp than normal. The Samnites quickly mustered their forces upon the arrival of the Romans and set out to get battle. 
The smaller camp was noticed by the Samnites, who believed that this meant that they were facing a smaller army, perhaps even only a forward scouting force. The common Samnite soldier wanted to assault the smaller Roman camp head on, as they believed they had a massive numerical advantage. The generals, however, realized that something wasn't quite right and ordered the Samnite army to stand down for the moment. The Samnites, though, were running out of supplies, and so nearly as soon as the army had stopped, they were forced to send out foraging parties to try to increase their food supply. The Samnites believed this to be fairly safe, as they assumed the small Roman camp was likely also short on food and too numerically weak to sally out. They were quickly proven wrong. As soon as Marcus Corvus saw the Samnite foraging parties leave the camp, he ordered his full-sized Roman army to charge straight into the Samnite camp. The ensuing battle was a complete and utter Roman victory. They even rounded up the Samnite foragers. The Samnites were once again ruthlessly slaughtered, and thus the Romans had their third victory in a row. This third victory apparently coincided with the end of the campaign season, and the consuls and their armies returned home. The two consuls were both given a triumph, and it seemed Rome had fully triumphed over the Samnites. The Carthaginians, yes, those Carthaginians, even sent Rome a 25-pound crown for the Temple of Jupiter Optimus Maximus in congratulations. However, this apparently wasn't the end of the war. The war would actually continue on paper for the next two years, until 341 BCE, but little to no fighting is recorded during these two years, and the two sides would eventually sign a peace treaty that was apparently very similar to the previous treaty, with the added acceptance of the Roman and Campanian alliance. Now we come to the slightly more boring, but just as important question of, was any of this real? Or did Livy just invent most of these events? Well, much like the events surrounding the beginning of the war, the truth is probably somewhere in the middle. There can of course be no doubt that some sort of fighting occurred. It is, after all, fairly hard to fight a war with no battles. In fact, it's even possible that only three battles occurred. After all, why would either side want to expend too many resources? The outline here is probably accurate once again. The real issue we have here are in the details. One of the most common themes in early Roman history is the missing nature of any actual primary sources. This is due to a variety of factors, the simple passing of time, various catastrophic events that destroyed records, the Gallic sack for example, and even some level of possible historical revisionism. For instance, why would the Romans want it known that they broke a treaty between themselves and the Samnites? That's exactly the sort of thing that you cover up. Anyway, the point here is that when Livy decided to write his histories, he didn't exactly have a trove of historical data to fall back on. Yes, he had some writings from various Republican Romans, and of course the various oral accounts, but he was missing the massive written records that would become fairly common in later Roman history. Instead of just being able to compile the various histories of Rome into one large compendium, Livy was forced to fill in the blanks. Because of this, we have to take many of his accounts with a grain of salt. For instance, Livy's story of Publius Decius Mus is almost a word-for-word -word copy of a Roman record of the First Punic War, where a centurion led 300 men to take a hill before the Carthaginians noticed and saved the Roman army in question from almost certain annihilation. Livy's account here is full of these strangely similar accounts, and it really calls into question what exactly we can believe. On the other hand though, Livy writes about this war with an air of embarrassment. He seems to really be disappointed in the way that Rome came to be at war with the Samnites, and even how the Roman army conducted itself in some portions of the battles. This is something completely out of left field for any Roman historian of the period. One of the most common themes in Roman history, that is written by Romans, is the greatness of the Roman state. Nearly every single instance of the Roman state doing something morally or legally wrong is explained away with either historical or ahistorical events that justify whatever action the state took. So this has actually convinced many historians that the general outline of events and maybe even the specifics are actually true. Otherwise, why would Livy invent Roman history that he was so embarrassed by? Personally, I really believe here that the general outline of events is accurate. Rome was at war with the Samnites, there were battles, and eventually the Romans won. However, I have some serious trouble believing the details of the battles in question. I mean, come on, 
The Romans supposedly nearly wipe out the Samnites in the first battle of the war, but they are still able to regroup and nearly defeat the Romans two more times. And then the Samnites were just so intimidated by the Romans that they just fled during the first battle. In the second battle, the man who just so happens to lead the Romans to their victories is a man who would come to be celebrated as one of the most important Roman heroes in the history of the Republic, with even the Roman Emperor Augustus commending him some 300 years later. It just all seems a little too convenient and fantastic for me to fully believe. Add to this that no other account backs Livy's stories up, and I just can't fully bring myself to accept his account. However, once again, the general outline here does seem to be accurate. Rome would establish their control over Campania following this war, and how else would they do that except through war? All in all, this seems to me to be another case of an accurate outline with a bit of fabricated details to fill in the gaps of Livy's sources. Whatever the truth may be, by 341 BCE the Romans and the Samnites had certainly made peace. Rome established their control over Campania, and now knew that they could defeat the Samnites. The question now was, would Rome and the Samnites remain committed to the renewed treaty of friendship, or would the two sides end up at war once again? Well, considering that this is only one of three Samnite wars, I'm sure you can answer that question yourself. But what would the next war look like? Would Rome steamroll the Samnites, or would a great war of attrition occur? Join me next time to find out. Thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed it, and I hope you learned something. Let me know what you thought about some of the new visual aspects of the video. They're not completely set in stone yet, and I'm still messing with them, so any advice or suggestions would be greatly appreciated. I do want to quickly apologize for being MIA over the past week. If you haven't seen my community post, I had a bit of an accident with a box cutter and ended up with some stitches in my index finger on my right hand. That basically meant that I couldn't use my right hand, and well, as a right-handed person, that sort of ruined me for about a week. I still have some pretty serious pain, but I've now gotten to the point where I can at least move my mouse and type without wanting to cry, so here we are. I should be back for good, and hopefully nothing else comes up. If you have any comments or questions on the video, or believe I've made a mistake, please comment down below, and please like and subscribe if you enjoyed, it really helps the channel out. Peace.